So good morning, everyone. I'm Ismail Kofi. I um, graduated in mathematics in the University of Bonn, uh, worked at several uh, companies and uh, in, in applied research institutes such as Fraunhofer, and uh, was very interested, inspired by the Snowden leaks, on privacy preserving technology and decentralization. And uh, from that, I started working at EBFL as a software engineer, uh, where I collaborated on scalability research on, on um, blockchains, but also on distributed decentralized systems and privacy. Um, so this uh, work inspired me to join Cosmos and Tendermint, which I also briefly introduced in this talk. So let's start. Um, first, I will reiterate some basics that are necessary to understand what is this blockchain thing we're talking about. Um, I will present some challenges. One of them is scalability that's already mentioned, but there are much more challenges uh, in the blockchain space or many problems that need solving um, that I will just briefly present. And um, then I will briefly talk about scalability and present one uh, scalability solution, which is not just one solution for scalability, but basically an ecosystem of solutions, which I will explain. So, to the basics, what is a blockchain? As you've seen, there are many different definitions. Uh, this definition serves the purpose of my talk the best, and um, it's also very simple because it's just a sentence, but there's a lot to digest. Um, so, a blockchain is a deterministic uh, state machine replicated on nodes, that do not necessarily trust each other. So what does it mean? Uh, a state machine, you could think of a state machine, um, you have several states and transitions to this state. You have an update function that takes the current state and a transition and updates to a new state. So in the context of blockchains, this could mean um, the state is the account balances and the transition could be a new block containing transactions in a certain order. Um, so this state is not stored at the central server or central service, but is replicated on nodes. And the tricky part is these nodes do not trust each other. So how do the nodes actually reach agreement on the state if they don't trust each other? So this leads us to consensus. Consensus algorithms are, uh, or consensus protocols are the tool that makes it possible um, for these nodes to reach agreement, there are two types of consensus algorithms, uh, roughly. Uh, one that assumes that nodes can only crash. They are heavily deployed in cloud infrastructure. For instance, if you use Google or AWS, your data is also replicated. It's not stored at a single server, but on many nodes. But it only assumes that you're in control of the nodes. Um, so a single entity is in control of the nodes, and you can trust those. So you can, you can, you, it only operates correctly under the assumption that those nodes can just crash. And the more interesting part uh, for a blockchain or for nodes that do not necessarily trust each other is that these nodes can behave completely arbitrarily. They can expose malicious behavior, often called Byzantine behavior, coming from the, a research paper that tried to solve the Byzantine generals problem, where generals um, that can only communicate through a messenger try to reach agreement if they should attack a city or not. Um, so examples of uh, these are PBFT and Tenement. Tenement I will roughly explain later. Um, so consensus can operate in different timing models. Uh, on the very left, we have synchrony, which basically means there's an upper bound for an unknown upper bound for the message delay, for the message to arrive. And there's complete asynchrony, which means um, uh, that you don't know uh, if there is such an uh, upper bound, or, there, or actually, no, there is no such upper bound, and messages could potentially be delayed forever. Um, so this is more or less how the internet, uh, many protocols on the internet come with this assumption, and in a very simple way to explain it, if you think of synchronous communication is more like a phone call, where you have direct feedback on how people interact, and asynchrony is more like writing an email, because you write an email, you write, send a message, you never know when the recipient will actually read it. So, um, and in between those, there are different timing models, semi-synchronicity and partial synchronicity. I'm not going into detail there, but it's interesting that there is also a middle ground that is interesting to explore. 
If you want to learn more about consensus, I can highly recommend this podcast I just linked there, which gives a histor historical overview on consensus algorithms and explains them in more detail. So now a few, um, a few limitations on what you can do on distributed systems in general. This is not specific to blockchain or um, any cryptocurrency or something. This is a general theorem that states in the, the, under the assumption of complete asynchronicity, no deterministic algorithm can uh, reach consensus under the assumption there's a single faulty node. Um, this is a very strong claim, and it's important to know. So what is interesting here, it only says for uh, deterministic uh, protocols. And also only complete asynchronous uh, sys uh, timing model, it doesn't work. So it's actually very necessary that they explore the middle ground. It sets the stage what we can actually do um, in consensus algorithms. And also you could have pro uh, probabilistic consensus algorithms. They are not um, impossible through this impossibility theorem. Another, um, another theorem that states what you can do in distribu distributed systems is the CAP theorem that was already mentioned by Ali. Um, so, it basically says you can only have two out of three properties, um, which is the properties are consistency, which means uh, the most, if you read from, let's say, the database, you get the most recent uh, write or an error. And availability means that you get a reply, you, get a, you always get a, a, um, a reply from the, uh, from the database, but it's not necessarily the most recent data. And partition tolerance means um, if you have a bunch of nodes that communicate with each other on the internet, um, what happens if the network splits and they, the messages between these two groups or partitions um, cannot communicate? Um, so this is something that happens all the time on the internet. And usually if you build distributed systems, you have to assume that partition tolerance um, is a necessary property you want to achieve. So you can only trade off basically uh, availability and consistency. So, um, for instance, Bitcoin that was mentioned um, is available, like uh, trade-offs availability for consistency, um, because what um, what can happen there is chain a chain can fork nodes um, get blocks that are um, that were propagated through the network, but they are not the longest chain that has been mined. So um, un until they get to the, the longest chain, they have to, um, when they get the, the longest chain, which is the actual ground truth, um, they have to throw away all the work that has been done. And um, then or if you read before from the, from the blockchain, basically you get stale data that was not actually representing what happened. Um, so next, this brings me to what challenges are blockchains currently facing? Um, so there's this idea of uh, replacing central authorities. The Bitcoin paper itself speaks about re replacing central banks, I think, and there's a large euphoria, and people want to live in a kind of decentral world where there's no uh, power agglomeration in, in congl uh, conglomeration on central powerful authorities. Why don't we see that yet? Why are we just talking about it? And what are the challenges we are facing in these systems? So one big challenge that um, is often overlooked is usability. So these systems usually they are built by experts, and they often assume that you know the stuff they do know they they know, and um, this hinders mass adoption. So. Often, if you deal with cryptocurrencies, you have to have a basic understanding of public key cryptography that was mentioned. But, I mean, for mass adoption, this is not uh, really good because most people don't want to know or don't, probably don't need to know these things. So, um, there's a trade-off to be made here as well about educating the people or building the systems in a way that you don't need to educate them. This is ongoing research, but I think the end user usability comes after um, we have actually systems that scale. But it's a very important thing to keep in mind if you build systems. Another challenge is also often overlooked is developer usability. So if you want to build on top of a blockchain, um, you want it to be as easy as possible for developers to build um, on top of that. So in the past, the only solution around has been, for instance, in a Zcash did that, um, which is a very interesting project, by the way. Um, 
they forked the source code of Bitcoin, changed the analogic of what happens there, and deployed a new blockchain called uh, Zcash. And um, this is quite cumbersome and very difficult to do. You have to know a lot of the inner workings of the source code and everything. Um, Ethereum changed that in a way that you can deploy smart contracts, which are basically programs, and you can uh, deploy them on top of the Ethereum blockchain. The only downside to this is you're um, stuck to the Ethereum blockchain and uh, you're stuck with the trade-offs that are made uh, in the Ethereum blockchain in terms of scalability and all these consistency and availability um, properties that underlie these systems. So um, this is very cool, but it comes with, with downsides as well. Um, this brings me to the next challenge. Usually if you build such systems, if you think of blockchains as basically replicated databases, these databases are not connected with each other at all. So basically if you have um, value on one chain, you cannot transfer value to the other chain easily. And the common approach today is you go through a central exchange or you introduce a central authority again and th that defeats the whole purpose of the blockchain. Um, so, yeah, we, we definitely need a way to uh, these chains to interact with each other, which does not come with the assumption that you trust a single central authority again. Um, another thing that was also mentioned already is privacy. Actually, blockchains are not privacy preserving per se. So if you think of Bitcoin, for instance, it basically... Um, Sorry. It basically, um, you could think of it as an Excel sheet which is like replicated on many computers and uh, the Excel sheet contains the history of all transactions in the public. Meaning, um, like Ian Myers said at DEF CON recently, it's like Twitter for your bank account. This is probably something you don't want. Um, in the context of this research community, you could think of, okay, if I store records of data or hashes of data on the blockchain, which is actually public data, that's totally fine. It's totally okay uh, to store this data publicly. But if you're dealing with highly sensitive uh, medical data, for instance, you obviously don't want that uh, publicly available, or even the metadata maybe of that. So there are trade-offs to be made between transparency, which is a property that blockchains definitely have, so it's very transparent, but um, you also want some form of privacy depending on your actual use case. And um, so there are trade-offs to be made and there's probably also a good reason why there won't be like a single uh, one-size-fits-it-all blockchain solution that solves all the problems. Um, another challenge we're facing is how do we actually change the inner workings of a deployed blockchain? So currently, how this often works is there's communication out of band, then people kind of try to reach an agreement somehow and propose solutions and then try to convince the community of their approach. And there's actually also no transparency here. Um, ideally, you would have the, the, the voting um, mechanism on top of the chain so it's transparent again. And people can vote um, ideally yeah, in, in some form of democratic system, uh, stakeholders of the chain or com the community members of the chain. Um, so something that was also kind of mentioned um, is energy consumption. Um, so Bitcoin uses, as you have heard, something called proof of work, which is not only necessary for consensus, but is mainly also uh, something called a civil control mechanism. So civil control mechanism is it um, makes it difficult or impossible for a malicious actor to flood the network with fake identities and take over the majority of the network with that. Um, so in Bitcoin, this is done by finding pre-images of, hash, uh, uh, of hashes, and this is a very difficult task. Basically, what you can do, you must basically try all different um, solutions, so it's an exhaustive search, more or less, and this is heavily energy consuming. People use specialized hardware for that, but it uses, for instance, Bitcoin annually uses uh, 73 uh, terawatt hours. So just to, to make this number a bit more um, understandable, this is like seven million US households or as much as the country of Austria. 
Ethereum, the numbers are slightly better, but it's still um, loads of energy consumed. There are people that argue that's fine because we can use renewable energy and, the energy and things like this, but the question still is, is it worth it uh, to have this energy consumption? I highly doubt it, but yeah, there's no, there's no clear um, question, uh, clear answer to this. And the main challenge and the most pressing uh, challenge we're facing is scalability. So scalability means um, mainly throughput, is how much transactions per second your blockchain can handle, and latency, how long to wait until a transaction is confirmed. And um, this in major blockchains, which uh, major public blockchains are currently deployed, like Bitcoin and Ethereum, this doesn't look very nice. The transaction per second rate is very low, like through, uh, from seven to maybe a few uh, hundred at, ma at max. And this doesn't scale. So if the world would actually use Bitcoin, the system would basically flood with transaction and it would more or less stop working. Um, another thing, uh, another topic in scalability is how do we reduce the data storage necessary um, for nodes to participate in the network? Um, Oh, and also for clients, so um, you, uh, the naive approach you commonly use in, 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 in uh, um, deployed blockchain system is you have to download the whole chain, verify all the transactions. It's infeasible for many commodity uh, um, hardware or smartphones. So slightly more on scalability, um, because it's such a pressing topic. Um, there are basically two different uh, approaches or two different families of approaches. One is so-called on-chain uh, scalability. Um, so this started off with the blockchain debate in, uh, debate in Bitcoin. If you increase the block size in Bitcoin or in, in all these systems, you can fit in more blocks. But this doesn't really scale, it doesn't really solve the problem because it only increases the throughput with a constant factor and it doesn't solve latency as well. Um, um, there is so much academic research, so the research community itself is building blockchains, by the way, and um, I put on the slide a few um, publications, the name of a few publications, each of which would deserve their own talk, sometimes quite complex uh, systems, um, but they're extremely interesting, and um, the thing I want to mention here is probably in a few years, we will definitely see a scalability solution even for on-chain, um, yeah, for single blockchains on-chain. Um, the downside of all these approaches is, again, it's like a one-size-fits-all uh, solution. They try to build one blockchain. Of course, you have to make trade-offs and you, have, you, you, you um, want one chain that basically scales, but still there's no interoperability involved. Um, and most of them are academic projects, and often there's no proper implementation, but for some, like Chainspace, there is actually a company that bu is building the implementation. Um, the other family of scalability approaches, as I said, there are two. The other family is um, layer two or off-chain solutions, where you take off the processing of the transactions from the chain and you merely use the chain as kind of a settlement layer or another analogous uh, would be um, you, if you transfer money, you only use the blockchain as kind of a court if there's a disagreement. So there's the Lightning Network, Raiden, um, if you're interested in those, uh, you should look them up. Also, we, we have in the audience people that are actually building uh, payment channel networks and um, so the, the big advantage of this approach is that you're building on top of existing well-established systems that have been around for a while. And the downside is you're still limited via the main chain, which is often like Bitcoin or Ethereum. So throughput there, transaction costs, all these things still exist. Um, often they don't incorporate interoperability as well, and they sometimes introduce the risk of centralization. Um, so what if uh, you could use oh, you could use another scalability approach where you have many parallel chains. They are mainly, uh, so they operate in, in parallel and you do the transactions on the particular chains for your particular application or use case. 
So there are two major projects, Polkadot and Cosmos. Cosmos I'm going to explain. And if you want to see uh, uh, um, a comparison of those, I linked the blog post that does a fair neutral comparison on the trade-offs made there. Um, so now to Cosmos. As I said, it's not yet another blockchain, but it tries to build basically a whole ecosystem of application-specific blockchains. Instead of deploying your own smart contract on something like Ethereum, you could also build your own application, which is their own chain, but it's still able to uh, communicate with all other chains. And with this approach, um, we try to solve scalability, interoperability, and usability. So Cosmos is powered by Tandem and BFT, which is the consensus algorithm. If you remember, um, um, so it's a perfectly Byzantine fault tolerant consensus algorithm, um, which operates in the parts of synchronous or in this middle ground. Um, so the key takeaway here is it's very fast. It can take thousands of transactions per second and produces a block every one to three seconds. Um, so for the civil control mechanism, we replaced proof of work in the main chain with proof of stake or delegated bonded proof of stake, which is less energy consuming and also gives you the advantage that you can incentivize um, honest behavior or punish um, uh, malicious nodes for misbehaving and not acting according to the protocol and also enables governance. So I want to highlight a little how Cosmos works and what you could do with it. You could use Tendermint, the, the consensus algorithm, and Tendermint Core, which wraps the state machine um, by using something we call the application uh, blockchain interface. And the cool thing here is if you're thinking of building any blockchain, maybe a private chain or a consortium chain or proof of authority chain, you could use this approach and um, basically uh, you can use this approach and code in any programming language. So if you develop a chain like this, so how do we connect those uh, chains? We connect those chains through a protocol called Interblockchain Communication Protocol. Um, it's very, so the details are a bit uh, difficult to grasp, but uh, the, the idea is very simple. If one chain wants to send a token to another chain, it basically um, locks the tokens on the first chain. It sends a proof to the other chain that the, the tokens have been locked. Um, they, this proof gets signed by validators of the first chain. And um, so then tokens with the same amount get created on the other chain. So it's like the very basic idea here. With this, you can uh, sovereign blockchains can exchange value. So now, how do we connect all the chains if they exist? Um, naively, you could connect all with each other. This would lead to a large communication overhead because for n nodes, you could think of like everyone's connected to everyone. This would cause, for instance, for 100 nodes, you would already have 5,000 connections. Instead, we use the approach of a hub uh, or hub and spoke approach where the, the hub um, connects the different chains, often we call them zones. Um, the zones don't communicate directly with each other, but instead through the hub, where the hub itself is a peer-to-peer -peer network. Um, so if this is not enough for you, and you, you still think, oh, maybe there's an easier approach, how could I build a blockchain myself? I recommend you to check out uh, the Cosmos SDK, which is a set of libraries that makes it extremely easy for you because some design decisions are already taken care of. And uh, the only downside is you're stuck to the programming language Go. For now, we also build other SDKs soon. And um, this is ideal if you want to build a public proof of stake chain. And it's a modular design. You can use existing modules. Uh, you still have to code, but it's much easier. You can learn more at the, uh, on the homepage I linked there. So the main takeaways, there are many challenges in the blockchain space that are hindering mass adoption, although there's a big hype. Um, scalability is the most pressing one. There are many, many smart people uh, and well-funded smart people that work on, these, uh, this, on the scalability problem. So we will probably see a solution there. It's, it's, uh, it's appropriate to be optimistic here. Um, Cosmos is one scalability solution that um, tries to establish a whole ecosystem. We often spoke of trade-offs, and not every application you want to build um, has to use the same trade-offs. So 
um, here you can explore all kinds of different trade-offs and build your own zones according to the specific needs you have. And the cool thing about this, you can also, if this research continues, and for instance privacy research continues, you can plug in another zone that makes use of this, and it's, um, the whole system still exists and operates in the same way. Thank you very much. I hope I didn't confuse you too much. <laughs> Thank you. Um, thank you very much thank for your you. presentation. Um, maybe we take one question. If there's a question. Yeah. Hi. The most challenging trade off with regards to scalability. Um, so I think you always have to make trade offs between few things like decentralization, security, and um, yeah, scalability basically. So these are these are the trade-offs you have to make, um, and I think there is no one. As I said, I think there is no one solution that will solve the scalability problem in general for all use cases. It's more likely that we will actually see an ecosystem of different chains. Actually, we're already seeing this, but they are not connected. So. Um, I can't answer this question because there is no single answer to it. It depends on your use case. Cool. Uh, I think for the uh, sake of time, uh, mm -hmm. there's going to be a panel as well. We will switch. Also, uh, Zönke has kind of sacrificed uh, his own talk now. But oh. um, I just uh, maybe uh, want to use this uh, moment uh, to, to highlight again that this uh, entire conference is really... I mean, we are all sitting here because of Zönke, and we should give him an applause. Uh, yeah.